Hey, you happy Sunday. You're listening to episode number 90 of the Keto Diet Podcast. I can't even believe it. Episode 90. That means we're so close to 100. Today we're chatting about how keto works, how soon you'll see results, mistakes women make on keto, and so much more. I really love doing episodes like this that gets back to basics because sometimes I know that I do this all the time. I like forget the beginning stages of keto and how far I've come in this process of being a ketogenic woman for almost four and a half years. And it's always nice to just talk about all the exciting things we still have yet to experience on our ketogenic diet and how things can continue to move forward. Even if we've been eating keto for a year, two years, three years, you still have so much more to look forward to. And I can attest Every couple of months, something else shifts and I'm like, wow, I didn't even think it could get better and it just keeps getting better. I've put together a podcast extra specifically for this episode. You can grab it at healthfulpursuit.com slash podcast slash E90. I got two awesome things for you. The first is that I just started my book tour. There's still time to register. So if you live in places like Minneapolis, Detroit, Seattle, Portland, Tampa, Austin, Houston, there's still time for, oh, and I forgot Nashville. I'm sure I forgot some other cities. But if you live in any of those cities or another city that's in the US, there's still time to register for my book tour. You can head on over to ketodietbook.com slash tour. I'll also put that link in the show notes. What you can expect on the tour is to hang out with me for anywhere between an hour to two hours. I do a keto talk at the beginning for about 45 minutes. Then I answer questions for another 30 to 45 minutes. And then I sign books, we take pictures. It's always a good time. And I hope that if you're in one of those cities, that we can hang out for a little while. And last but not least is that we're going to be chatting about the basics of the ketogenic diet and the benefits of keto and also a little bit about blood sugar control cravings and what it's like when you are addicted to carbs. I put together a little freebie. It's a free download. You can get it anytime at healthfulpursuit.com slash sugar, which shows you how cortisol actually plays a role in a lot of the sugar cravings that you're having and how carb addiction falls in line with that and five proven steps that you can take right now to end the conundrum. Okay, let's do this thing. Welcome to the Keto Diet Podcast, the show all about keto for women, so you can burn fat, balance your hormones, heal your body, quickly adapt to a ketogenic diet, avoid common struggles, and get the results you crave. And now, here's your host. You might know her as the Keto Queen. She's the international best-selling author of The Keto Diet, founder of Happy Keto Body, and she loves dipping pork rinds in avocado oil mayo, Leanne Vogel. Okay, this is the part in the show generally where you'd hear me list off a bunch of sponsors and ads and things that I'm trying but we're not doing that anymore. (laughs) And and people are saying that I'm crazy for doing this, partners too, and I might be crazy. And it's not to say that the sponsors and ads that were on the podcast were at all false. I, I love all those brands and I still use those brands. I just felt like spending so much of my time and energy focused on partners was taking away from where I actually felt lit up in my life and in my business. And that is to give you free resources to better your life and to empower you to make choices as it comes to your health and your wellness. So we've shifted things around a little bit. There's no more sponsors. There's no more ads. You will not hear ads on this podcast in this place um, for the foreseeable future. So if you are a little bit sad at the fact that you no longer have coupon codes for me, do not worry. I have put everything at healthfulpursuit.com slash favorites. So So if you enjoyed some of the savings codes I did share, I'm going to still keep that up as a resource. You just won't hear me 
talking about them. So check back to favorites often if I find new things that I love and I manage to find a coupon code or ask them to develop one. I might put it up there, but I just I just really want to get back to creating the podcast, coming out with brand new concepts, working on books and programs, and that's where I want to put my focus. And that's what you've told me you want me to focus on too, so I'm happy to oblige. Okay, our guest today is Dr. David Jockers, who is a doctor of natural medicine, a functional nutritionist, and corrective care chiropractor. He currently owns and operates Exodus Healthcare in Kennesaw. Kennesaw? I never even knew driving through Kennesaw, how people said it. It's in Georgia and runs one of the top natural health sites, drjockers.com. Try saying that three times fast. With over 1 million monthly visitors and his content has been seen across popular media sites such as the Dr. Oz Show. Dr. Jockers is a world-renowned expert in the area of ketosis and the ketogenic diet and he is a developer of the best-selling e-course Navigating the Ketogenic Diet and the host of the Keto Edge Summit. So we're going to be chatting about a lot about the benefits of ketosis, hence the title of the podcast episode today. And if you already have a copy of my digital program, The Keto Beginning, we go through a bunch of the benefits that we didn't even list off in this podcast episode on page 13. So if you want to know more about that and you have that program, it's available to you there. And on page 45 of my digital program, Fat Fueled, it goes through the benefits of being in ketosis and becoming fat fueled and kind of compares the two. So if you are already have those two resources. There you go. Now you can read up on that and follow along in the podcast. It'll be really great. So let's get to this interview. Hey, Dr. Jockers, what's up? Hey, Leanne. So great to be on with you. I was just telling you that uh, we had our baby girl. We named her Joyful. We just had her two weeks ago. So amazing. beautiful home I didn't birth. even ask. I didn't even ask for her name. That is an amazing <laughs> name. Yeah, Joyful Christine, because we. I always like the name Joy. And um, my wife came up with Joyful, and I'm like, I've I've never met somebody with that that name, but like that's exactly the kind of energy I want her to bring to the world. So just makes sense. Oh, she's set up for success. <laughs> yeah, that is exactly. So cool. That is so cool. For listeners that may not be familiar with you, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about you? Yeah, absolutely. And so my name is Dr. David Jockers, and I am a doctor of natural medicine and doctor of chiropractic and a nutritionist and really got into the health space in general because I was an athlete growing up. I always wanted to improve my performance. And one thing led to another and I I became a personal trainer and then kind of watched some personal tragedy with my grandfather. I struggled with health issues and my mom was always into natural health. And so whenever I had a question, I would always go to her start asking her what to do. She always grew her own food and she's actually a naturopath now. Growing up, she was a massage therapist. She was kind of studying natural medicine and, um, you know, it just kind of evoked my curiosity and I decided I wanted to become a chiropractor. And I went to uh, Life University in Atlanta, Georgia, and just started studying. I loved the philosophy that the body could heal itself. I loved everything to do with nutrition, movement, taking care of the spine and the nervous system. And actually, while I was, you know, really right as I was getting going with graduate school, I actually developed irritable bowel syndrome. And so I, I actually lost 30 pounds and I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm thin as it is. I went from 165 pounds down to 135 pounds. And um, really was struggling with my gut. Couldn't, you know, no matter how much I ate, I couldn't put any weight on. I couldn't put any muscle mass on. I was fatigued. I had a, a condition called orthostatic hypotension where I go from sitting to standing and I would get really, really dizzy. And I was in graduate school and my, my colleagues, people around me were concerned about it. And, uh, you know, I, I came across some books and uh, Joe Mercola, drmercola.com, The Maker's Diet from Jordan Rubin. I started reading these books and I went on a low carb diet and, and uh, you know, along with chiropractic care and really focusing on good sleep and just good lifestyle. And I was able to overcome that, gain the weight back and really got my energy and my life back. And so from there, I was just even more passionate about teaching these principles to people. And I got out of school at, at 27 and I opened my own clinic on credit cards and uh, the, the economy had crashed. And so I couldn't get a business loan. So I took out every form of credit that I could, opened my clinic and it was like a, a build it and they will come type mentality. I had no idea what I was doing, but I just hustled like crazy and um, had a lot of success by the world standards. But I was working 80 hour weeks. I was actually, Leanne, living in my clinic 
and showering across the street at a 24 hour gym. Cause you know, I was a single guy at the time, <laughs> very low maintenance. And so I was like, you know, I was going to work all the time anyways. And that's what I was doing. And I actually developed skin cancer. And so I was, I was being successful. I was living a healthier lifestyle than most people, but I was overwhelming my system. And there were just a lot of things that were out of balance. And, you know, I was working so hard. I would come home at night and I would binge on like, you'll, you'll laugh at this Ezekiel bread, with coconut, coconut oil and, and blueberries or something along those lines. Amazing. And so uh, this was in 2011 and I started researching. I knew I needed to change my life. And fortunately, I was able to buy a house and kind of get out of my clinic and get away from some of the, the toxic things. Like I was sleeping like right under, right under where the power panel is in the back of my office. So you think about the electromagnetic frequency stress. I mean, just I was showering in a, in a gym with chlorinated water. So it was all these different things. So I created more balance in my life. Started really working on myself mentally, emotionally, spiritually, because I was really led by a, a fear of failure at the time. And so I was really started to work and 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 look into that and just work on myself in that area and nutritionally i was doing research and i came across the ketogenic diet and i had never really heard of that term it, it, growing, going through medical school i had heard of ketoacidosis and i heard of ketones but it was like just briefly in passing and i have a master's degree in sports nutrition and we really didn't talk about it at all and so i started looking into this and in fact um the interview I was looking at and an article I was reading online was from Dr. Thomas Seyfried. And he is one of the top researchers in really this idea that cancer is a metabolic, it's really a, uh, a metabolic disease. And I picked up his book, which is something along those lines, cancer as a metabolic disease. And um, I started reading that and I was like, so fascinated by it. And I'm like, you know what, I'm going to do this myself. And I started doing that, following that approach along with the, the whole lifestyle and I was able to overcome that skin cancer. I had this big welt and it's kind of a long story how it developed, but um, you know, in a matter of three or four months, it completely went away. And so I just felt like, gosh, I had victory over this condition. And my grandfather actually died from metastatic skin cancer. So it's in my family. I grew up in Florida on the beach, surfing and just being exposed to way more sun, you know, just being sun damaged more than what, than somebody should be. And uh, I just saw the power of nutrition and lifestyle there. And so from there, I started holding cancer seminars and just teaching people this lifestyle and have seen so many remarkable breakthroughs in a number of different health conditions, as well as just people optimizing their performance on a daily basis. And that's really what keto means to me is just this high level performance on a daily basis allows me to really be the best doctor, the best husband, the best father, the best everything in my life because I'm fat bur I'm a fat burner and I'm uh, really just running on 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 really clean fuel all day long. So that's kind of a long answer there, but uh, I guess that will get us started. Yeah. And you know what's great? My next question, which I ask all guests is what does keto mean to you? So you already answered that question. It's <laughs> like you knew it was coming up. I think it's such an important question. And it's so cool to see how keto means something completely different for each and every single person. I I just I love asking that question. And I had no idea of your story. I think that that's so amazing that you were able to use the ketogenic diet and also be intuitive to know that the place that you were in like living out of your practice was not beneficial for your overall health. But so cool that you trusted the universe and was like, I'm just gonna figure this out. It'll just work itself out because that that can be a terrifying leap to take. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, that's really where the chiropractic philosophy helped me, which was this idea that, you know, live without fear. It's like there's natural rhythms in the in the universe and nature and in our bodies. And you know, when we're out of when we're out of balance with that, dis hyphen ease, right? Dis hyphen ease comes and then eventually disease comes. And so I just needed to get back in balance and uh, you know, mentally physically and spiritually, because I mean, it, we're a mind, body and spirit all coalescing together. So, you know, the ketogenic diet really helps with that. And because there's, you know, a ketogenic diet, when you've got elevated ketones, it really allows your brain to function so much better. So mentally and spiritually, you're able to go deeper and uh, dig out some some false beliefs there too. I'm glad that you mentioned the spiritually because and I just call it keto magic. <laughs> After eating keto for a while, it's just like all of a sudden I started thinking differently about life in general, mm. just like 
how I interacted with people, how I thought about myself. And I never really had that ability before. Is that kind of what you mean by the spiritually piece? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a, when we look at keto, we know that it helps regulate the glutamate to GABA balance, which are two neurotransmitters. And glutamate's kind of an excitatory neurotransmitter, allows us to think sharply and quickly. We need that because we want to think sharply and quickly. We want to be able to react to stress. But GABA helps calm our brain, helps relax our brain so it doesn't overexcite itself and we don't end up with anxiety and things like that. And most of us in our society, because we have such a hot, you know, fast paced society, most of us are under stress. We're just firing glutamate and we've got a, you know, bad purport. We've got a bad ratio of glutamate to GABA and people will even supplement with GABA and, and see really good results. It'll help reduce anxiety and you know, a lot of anti-anxiety medications help support the GABA pathways, you know, help them sleep better help reduce headaches, things like that. Well, ketones naturally have this effect of creating balance and stability there. So you just, you you get the benefits of thinking sharply and quickly without overexciting yourself. You've got less inflammation in your brain. So it allows you to, in a sense, unlock some of your dormant potential. I think there's incredible potential within us as humans, but a lot of it lies dormant because we're so, you know, living out of a, 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 a fast paced society, a, um, you know, just a, a fear based society, and we're constantly in fight or flight. And so this ketones in our brain and following this sort of a, a lifestyle really helps balance that and open up that dormant potential. And that's amazing. And how you mentioned fast paced and fear based society, what do you do on a daily basis? Um, now that you're a dad, and you own a business, like, how do you maintain that balance for yourself? I have no idea. <laughs> but <laughs> Balance? Yeah. What's that, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. You know, it's one of those things where I think it just starts with my default mentality and just constantly focusing on gratitude and having an overcomer spirit. Yeah, I mean, at this point in my life, I have three businesses, three kids, right? And three kids under three, right? So I don't know how I'm doing it. But uh but, you know, it's just one of those things where I constantly are reminding myself how grateful I am for where I am in life and for what God's got in store for me for the future. And so I think that's the biggest thing. And then surrounding myself with really good people. You know, when it comes to businesses, I just try to empower all my employees as much as possible, let them know how much I appreciate them. You know, with my, my wife and I have a phenomenal relationship. We're always speaking words of life over each other. I know if she's getting upset at me, it's because she doesn't feel loved or heard, right? I already know know like exactly what I'm not doing. And so I just try to really anchor in on that. Of course, the kids are, you know, I've, my two little two and a half year olds are running around all over the place. And I just try to realize they're going to be kids. You know, it's just who they are. It's what they're going to be. I, I need to either embrace it or I'm going to, uh, you know, only cause more harm to myself. So I just try to embrace it the, the best that I can. And, you know, this ketogenic lifestyle, just living a healthy lifestyle, waking up in gratitude. I love to move and exercise. I hydrate my body really, really well. I eat really well. I take supplements. I get chiropractic care. I know that my body is a high performance machine and I want to make sure the fuel is good. I want to make sure that I'm getting, you know, my system checked on a regular basis and making sure everything is working well because I have got in my, you know, obviously for me, the most important job in the world, every single day, I've got so many people counting on me. I've got to show up at a hundred percent. And so I think that's huge and a really good sleep, sleep habits as well. Trying to get to bed early so, so important. Poor sleep really throws me off. So better that I can uh, have good sleep habits. That's, uh, that's a huge component to, uh, to being able to show up each and every day. Mm. And I love that you said, you know, I got to embrace it or it's just going to harm myself. That's something I've been coming to the realization of, especially lately, where I just get frazzled over things and I get focused on things. And I'm like, wait a minute, like this is not benefiting me. And it's just either I just need to embrace it or just not or know that I'm harming myself. Um, so it's really great that you touched on that. So because we wanted to chat about the benefits of keto, and we've already chatted about a, a huge major benefit, one of my favorites, which is that spiritual component and just how I'm so much more aligned with myself eating this way. And because this is more of like a beginner's episode, I wanted to kind of focus on how keto works in the body and, and then kind of morph into 
you know, um, the changes we might see in our body after adopting a ketogenic diet. Yep. So basically, when you know, we're on a standard American diet, like the way that I grew up, you know, in the morning, I'd wake up, I was always hungry. And I would go and I would eat a bowl of Cheerios, right? Or something like that. Cheerios with bananas and uh, orange juice and skim milk because, you know, Cheerios are healthy. That was like, you know, American Heart Association approved. Bananas, of course, that's a fruit. Orange juice, lots of vitamin C. And of course, we want to stay away from fat. So we use skim milk. And, uh, you know, so anyways, I would do that. And of course, all those things would just turn into sugar and my system blood sugar would go way up. And then this hormone called insulin comes out. And insulin's job is basically to get sugar out of the bloodstream because high blood sugar is neurotoxic. You, so, you think about somebody with uncontrolled diabetes where they can't clear the sugar out of their bloodstream. And what happens? The, the sugar molecules actually bind to proteins in the body and they create something called an advanced glycolytic enzyme. And so for the listeners, advanced starts with the A, glycolytic starts with the G, and enzyme starts with the E. So if we take those three letters, A, G, E, that spells ages. So that will tell you exactly what that does to you. It accelerates the aging process and it damages the kidneys. So people with uncontrolled diabetes, oftentimes they develop kidney failure, damages the endothelial lining, the internal lining of the blood vessels. So these individuals are at risk for heart disease. It damages the nerves. So they develop peripheral neuropathy, optic neuritis where they lose their, their vision, dementia, Alzheimer's, they're calling type 3 diabetes because... It's characterized by this neuroinflammation from these AGEs. So insulin has this huge job of getting the sugar, getting it into the cells so we don't form all these AGEs. Now, the unfortunate thing is insulin also does some other things. When insulin is elevated, it's like this master hormone. It tells the body store, store, store. That means store fat. So it's going to end up causing for somebody that's genetically inclined, uh, like for me, it won't really, I won't really get fat, but for other individuals, they're going to get much larger. For me, it'll actually, I just won't be able to gain muscle. I'll be like a skinny fat if I have high insulin. And uh, insulin also triggers cell reproduction. So we know that certain chronic diseases like cancer are characterized by high levels of cell reproduction. So when we have high levels of insulin because we're eating these you know, high carbohydrate foods, then we're going to get accelerated cell reproduction. There's also more inflammation. Insulin actually triggers certain genetic pathways. So these are kind of amplifiers in the body, like literally you know, a, an alarm system that the whole city can hear that are saying, create inflammation, create inflammation, our body's in danger, create inflammation. And that's what ends up happening. We end up getting chronic inflammation when we continually do this. And so when we go on a ketogenic diet, it's a very low carb, high fat diet. And so with that, we really don't elevate our blood sugar much when we consume food. And so we get very little amount of insulin. And therefore, because insulin stays low, we don't get the inflammation. We don't get the fat storage. Our body actually now says, you know, I need to use another fuel source other than sugar because I don't have enough blood sugar. And so it'll start to actually adapt and not only use the dietary fat, the fat we're eating from foods, but also our own body fat. Because when insulin is down, the body says, okay, I need to burn my storage. I need to jump into my bank account and look at my savings account. And the savings account is our stored body fat. And it will start to break that down, mobilize it, and utilize that for energy. While it's doing that, the body has to do several things. Number one, within every cell of our body, the factory that breaks down and it produces, breaks down fatty acids and produces energy from them is called a mitochondria. And the mitochondria are going, our body's going to actually create more of these mitochondria so we can produce more energy. And so it's a process called mitochondrial biogenesis. And it actually gives our body better potential to produce cellular energy, which is really powerful. So we actually increase the amount of mitochondria. Now, exercise will also increase mitochondria. The cool thing is, the ketogenic diet without even exercising will increase the amount of these mitochondria. The more mitochondria, the healthier the cell. And so without even exercising, we can do that. Obviously, if we combine those, we're going to get a really powerful stimulus for the cell, and that's going to help protect our genome 
from oxidative stress and other issues like that. And so we get good at burning fat. So we, we no longer are the sugar burner. When we're a sugar burner, we're dependent upon regular feedings. Every, several, every few hours, we need to bump up our blood sugar because our sugar is going up and down. Right, sugar goes up, insulin comes out, takes the sugar into the cells. Now sugar goes down. The body says, "Uh "Oh, this is stressful. Sugar's going down. We may be starving." So now it sends signals that give us cravings. We get hangry, irritable. Um, You know, this is a a symptom called uh, or a condition called hypoglycemia that we end up developing. And we're constantly depending. We're constantly hungry. We have cravings. We don't feel good. Our energy is fluctuating as opposed to when we're in ketosis, then we can go very long periods of time without food. That oftentimes we don't even think about food that off, that that much and and um, we don't have the hunger and the cravings. Our blood sugar stays really, really stable. We get that mental and emotional balance that we were talking about and our body is good at burning body fat so we'll take on the kind of physique over time that, uh, that we want to, because our body's just going to start to break down that body fat. And especially if we couple it with other healthy lifestyle activities, it's going to really help us take on that lean optimal physique that we want. And what we often talk about like physical changes, and we chatted a little bit about the changes that happen inside, um, like lowered blood sugar, lowered inflammation. But I feel like there's this huge thing. And I don't know if you experience it too, where people are like, I started keto three weeks ago and nothing's happening. This is stupid. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, Do you come across that? And kind of what's your way to combat that Um, where people are just thinking it'll happen tomorrow? Yeah, absolutely. So in a sense, when we are trying to get keto adapted or fat adapted, our body is adapted to running off of its own body fat there is an adaptation process that needs to take place. And we kind of, in some ways, get into this metabolic uh, middle ground where our body was really dependent on glucose and it had upregulated all the different metabolic machinery in order to break down glucose. Now we're not providing the, the blood sugar that it needs So it's got to retrain itself and learn how to use fat for fuel. And for some individuals, if they're more metabolically flexible, if their bodies are healthier, it it can be a fairly quick process. It can take five to 10 days maybe. For other individuals, it can take a few weeks. So it just really depends on your metabolic flexibility and the health of your system when you first get in. Now, there's another condition. This is especially, uh, I see this with people that, um, you know, are just making certain mistakes or are not thinking through exactly how to follow their ketogenic diet properly. And that's called the keto flu, where you feel really hungover, you have leg cramps, you have sometimes heart arrhythmias where your heart's just pounding out of your chest. You feel really hung, you just, just really uh, hung over and, and maybe trouble sleeping, things like that. And oftentimes there's a couple of things associated with this. Number one, uh, the individual can be overstressed. They may be exercising too much, not, not following good sleep habits. They may have a really, really stressful family life or stressful job. And whenever you're trying to make a major lifestyle change, you want to reduce other stresses in your life. Okay, a lifestyle change is stressful on your body. In fact, you know, stress makes us stronger when it's done appropriately. But if your body's overwhelmed by stress, you're going to really struggle. So you want to get things in order first. So that person may, again, have too much stress in their life. So that's one big thing. Number two is they may not be consuming enough electrolytes. And this is really important because when your insulin goes down, like it should when you go low carb, then your body actually isn't going to be able to retain electrolytes the way that it should. So insulin is not only not only is its job to take sugar and put it into the bloodstream or out of the bloodstream and into the cells, but also on top of that to uh, take to actually retain sodium in the body. And so when insulin goes down, we start to excrete more sodium and we can end up with a lot of different electrolyte issues. Okay, electrolyte imbalances which can lead to dizziness, feeling like we've got the flu, trouble sleeping, arrhythmias, all different types of issues like that. So that's another really, really big factor with this. And then the other thing would just be bouts of hypoglycemia where the blood sugar is dropping too low. So I typically, with, with certain individuals, if they're not metabolically fit to begin with, will not have them do things like high-intensity exercise, intermittent fasting, and a ketogenic diet all at once. 
I don't find that to be helpful for most people when they first get started. Much better off just consuming meals every three to four hours for somebody that stru- that tends to struggle with hypoglycemia every three to four hours, but just change out the foods. Take out the high carbohydrate foods and replace those with higher healthy fat foods like avocados, olives, olive oil, um, grass-fed butter, and eggs, different things like that. So that's typically a, a big change that that I'll uh, that I'll make now. A second part of that question would be somebody that's maybe having a weight loss plateau, and that can be a number of different factors as well. You know, as a as a functional medicine doctor, I I will look at people's thyroid, and I oftentimes see people with low thyroid function to begin with that was never really either diagnosed or treated properly, and so there are certain medications or supplements that people can take that can really support thyroid hormone production and get the thyroid boost that they need to kind of get them over a plateau that they may be experiencing. And when your thyroid is expressing itself at the cell uh, at the appropriate level, it makes a big, huge difference in how you feel. I mean, things like hair loss for women, dry skin, coldness, you know, just cold extremities, constipation, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes these are related to poor thyroid hormone expression that was either, again, never diagnosed or missed, you know, just underdiagnosed or never treated properly. So these are our key factors we've got to address. I'm glad that you mentioned the thyroid piece because that was a huge, when I discovered that I had been hypothyroid for years and no doctor told me, yeah. <laughs> and then I fixed my thyroid. I mean, I'm a totally different human. <laughs> like It makes such a big difference, doesn't it? I mean, it's night and day difference. It's night and day difference. And I mean, there it's very rare that I forget my thyroid medication in the morning because unfortunately my thyroid is beyond help at this point. And I'm just, it's where I am right now with taking medication. Medication. I take desiccated thyroid. If the off chance that I forget it, it's like once a year that I forget it for one day. I'll go like one hour. I'll be like, something's not right. Like my brain is kind of not right, and my energy's weird. My just everything is off. My digestion is weird, and it's it's so sudden. And just it's a slight little change, but it's amazing how long people can go. And I think a lot of women, especially that I've talked to are like ashamed to get help with their thyroid. I don't know what that's about. Do you see that in your practice where people just don't, they just don't think it's important? Well, you know, I don't really see that people don't think it's important, but I I think that oftentimes, especially in our world, because we're helping people with nutrition and supplements and things like that, that a lot of times people have a negative slant towards anything that's a, a prescription. And they're like, well, you know, I don't want to take the Synthroid or whatever it is. Now, when it comes to thyroid, I definitely have a, a you know, a, I definitely would would recommend trying some sort of a desiccated form like you're doing, like Armor Thyroid or Nature Thyroid or something like that. And you can even do supplements like there's glandulars that that you can get. I know I sell one that I've seen a remarkable results with non, you know, prescription based and people getting awesome results with. However, sometimes, you know, if somebody's feeling good and they're taking Synthroid and they're like, you know, this is really helpful me. I'm like all for it. I'm like, great. You know, take that and support the rest of your body. You know, you got to really, not all medications. I mean, you want to minimize the amount that you're on, of course. Right. But, you know, in the case of the thyroid, you definitely want to get the right thyroid support. I think it's just, uh, it's, it's vital. And, and, and you are, as you know, Leanne, you're not alone. There's so many women that are just not diagnosed they're, they're, The thyroid is not looked at, or it's not looked at thoroughly enough or the, the ranges that the doctors are looking at. They're just not even, most clinically clinical medicine doctors, not you know, functional medicine doctors, we're really well trained typically on thyroid conditions. Whereas in clinical medicine, it's very, they're really not trained very well in that area. And um, they typically don't address it very well. Yeah, it's really sad. And also even the ranges, I spoke to somebody today about his um, free T3 and he thrives at 2.9. And I, if I'm at a 2.9, I'm like in my bed, not moving, can't even think. My hair is falling out. My skin is flaking off. I'm not a happy camper. I do really good at 6.5. But when I get my thyroid tested, by a regular doctor and they see 6.5, they're like, what are you doing? It's too high. You got to lower it. I'm like, no, 
no, this is, I don't feel good at six. I don't feel good at 5.5. I don't feel good at 6.7. My number is 6.5. So it's also like those ranges are really challenging too. Um, So it's nice to work with a functional doctor where you can like have that conversation. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, the labs should really give us a starting place, but ultimately we've got to, we've got to actually treat the individual, you know, and that's really what it's all about. And the great thing about you, Leanne, is through the years, and it took you a while to get there, but you, you've basically earned a master's degree in your own health. You've mastered your own health. And that's what I tell my clients. I'm like, really the path to lifelong wellness is getting a master's degree in your own health. So if you went to college to get a degree, you would spend a lot of time, money, and energy uh, in order to get that. But at the end of the day, you would have some sort of a trade or some sort of a degree that you would have for you with you for the rest of your life. And you know, when it comes to your health, it's the same process. You're not a pill away from great health. You're you're mastering. You've got to learn how to master the rhythms of your body and figure out exactly what you need at this season of life. And that just comes with trial and error. And it comes through, you know, listening to podcasts like this and uh, engaging, getting books like your book is is awesome. I recommend it all the time, you know, whether it's getting, you know, keto programs and different things like that to help, you know, just help help you learn and understand and, and see what other people are dealing with and um, kind of understand the rhythms that your body and the, the messages your body is giving you over time, you're going to develop that level of mastery. Yeah. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when I didn't care about my body and I didn't want to know, I didn't want to master much of anything. And I think a lot of people have the, um, the belief that there's just one thing that they can do. Like if you eat coconut oil once a day, every day for the rest of your life, you'll be (laughs) the healthiest human being. And that's all you need to do. And unfortunately it doesn't work like that. But do you ever run across clients that are like, I don't want to be a master of my diet. Like that's why I hired you. Like just figure it out. Tell me what to do. I don't care. Do you ever come across that energy? Well, certainly I think, you know, that the passivity is, uh, you know, that, and especially the older generation, I think was trained in that, that, Hey, just do exactly what the doctor says and that's it. Never question it. Um, what I'm seeing is more and more people in the younger generation and even, even, you know, some of the baby boomers now are starting to say, Hey, I know this is an information age. I can get information anywhere. I need a coach. And I, and I try to explain that with my patients that, Hey, I'm a coach. I'm not, you know, I'm not just going to tell you, okay, just do this and that's it. And, you know, and, and, we've got to understand so a lot of it's troubleshooting. So I try to explain it as well as I can up front. And, um, you know, I think ultimately the greatest lie we can believe is that we're just one thing away from anything in our lives, you know, and typically it's always a process. Any sort of goal that we have in our life, there's always a process. It's always a learning process in order to get there. Mm-hmm. Yes. Something so simple is always made more complicated as you get into all the little tiny little steps that you need to make in order to make that thing happen. It's, I mean, it's like anything. You don't just say, I want to go back to college and learn how to do X, Y, Z. Oh, got it. You know, like you have to go to the classes and you have to learn and that's just the process. Um, So that's really good. And there was something you said a little while ago, and I just want to go back to it quick because somebody may have heard something different. I just want to reiterate. So you said if somebody has hypoglycemia and they're getting started with the keto diet, they would start eating meals every three to four hours. I think somebody might hear that and think, oh, if I have hypoglycemia on keto, I need to eat every three to four hours. So I just want to clarify that I think you meant like eat every three to four hours as your hypoglycemia figures itself out. And like, naturally, you'll just. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's part. Exactly. It's part of the adaptation process. So when you first get in, if you have a tendency to have hypoglycemia, I wouldn't recommend fasting right away. I'm a huge, huge advocate of intermittent fasting. I, I practice it every day. And um, I do two 24 hour fasts every week. I'm a huge advocate of it. And I, I would, I, you know, one of my goals is to help my clients develop a level of metabolic flexibility to where they could do that if they like. But that's not a great place to start if you have a tendency towards hypoglycemia, if you're really stressed, and especially if you start keto and you're struggling with, with some of that, um, it's better to create, you know, in a sense, like exercise, you'd want to start with if you want to run a 5k um, yet you have never exercised you might want to start by just walking a mile 
And yeah, that may, you may be really sore afterwards. And so you've got to start somewhere. So typically what, what I'll do, if you're somebody that, and, and I use questionnaires or I'll, I'll ask in person, I'll say, Hey, you know, how do you feel typically, you know, on whatever diet you're on, um, four hours after you eat, how do you feel? Are you, are you hungry? You have cravings, you have headaches, is your energy dropping. And they're like, yeah, it seems like I've got to eat. I'm always hungry. Then I'm not going to start them out intermittent fasting. That may, that's hopefully something that we can move towards down the road, but I'm going to start them out eating every three to four hours so we can get that until we can build up the, me- the metabolic flexibility. And then over time, I just tell them, Hey, listen to your body. If you don't feel hungry. And I see this all the time after a week, the person's like, you know, I have that morning keto protein shake. And then like, I don't think I can eat at 12. Like I'm, I'm, I'm so full and I'm like, great. <laughs> I'm like, then, then uh, let's, you know, wait till you're hungry, have something available. So when you f- actually start to feel hungry, then uh, go ahead and eat. And a lot of times they're fine waiting till dinner. And uh, so it's just kind of a natural process that develops. That's the best, like of all of the things that I love about keto. I mean, the spirituality piece is really cool, but that metabolic flexibility and just like yeah. not having to care <laughs> about like food all the time. Like I had hypoglycemia. I had to eat every two hours. I had f- snacks in my bag all of the time. It was so much energy. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So much thought that goes into it. Oh. You had to build your whole life around it. I remember when I was a personal trainer in my early 20s, it was like I had to eat, I had to have a big protein shake right before I went to bed. Then I wake up in the morning and I had to have like this big bowl of Quaker oatmeal squares with blueberries and peanuts on it. And it was like, (laughs) I was like my whole life revolved around what I was going to eat, eating six meals a day. Yeah. I just, I can't go back to that life. It's too much work. Um, Okay. So what are the mistakes that you see your clients, specifically women making over and over again with keto? Like they're just, just fake. <laughs> well, you know, like, like I said before, definitely the stress level and poor sleep habits. I think those are really, really big mistakes that, that are made. Also, especially with women, it kind of depends on if they're still menstruating or not. But what I find is for women who are menstruating, oftentimes we may need to do some carb cycling, uh, particularly during different phases of their cycle. Like in the follicular phase, we may do, which is kind of the first 14 days of the cycle, the body's needing more estrogen during that period of time. And estrogen responds to insulin. And so we, um, we may need to bump up carbs just a little bit. Okay. And oftentimes we'll do something like one carb day, right? And see how they do with that, right? Where they're doing higher amount of carbs, maybe 80 to 150 grams, depending on how they feel um, on that day and just kind of see how they do. And we might do six days, you know, of lower carb. And so we're kind of trying to find the right carb cycling approach for those individuals. And then usually the back end of their cycle. So like the first, when we look at the cycle, the first half menstruation is usually like the first four or five days. Okay. So, and then, and then you hit ovulation and then that's kind of the second half takes place fifth day, 15 to 28, theoretically, you know, everybody's like a little bit different and unique, but that's called the luteal phase. And typically that phase, the person responds better to low carb. So they usually do better uh, low carb there. So you may notice even that you're craving more carbs in that beginning phase of the cycle. So I try to have the woman just pay attention to that, listen to that and um, carb cycle appropriately. And I find that to be really good. And if the person just feels great, low carb, which is I see often as well, then I just tell them to be aware of it. But like, doesn't mean they have to carb cycle just because, you know, we have, you know, these natural rhythms in the body and you have more estrogen in that first half of the cycle. Doesn't mean you have to bump it up. If you're feeling good in ketosis, then keep, keep it going. Just be aware of it. So I think that's a big thing. Not getting enough electrolytes, I find to be a huge problem across the board and not hydrating well. So I tell my, my people to make sure that when you wake up in the morning, start your day with water and electrolytes. You know, we are bioelectric beings, meaning that literally the information flows through electrical currents in our body and we conduct electricity through water and electrolytes. So 
grab a little bit of like pink Himalayan salt or Redmond's real salt, some sort of really good salt. And uh, just put a pinch in your water, drink 16 ounces of water. You can, if you want to take it to the next level, you can put lemon in there, which has a whole bunch of different great compounds, vitamin C, bioflavonoids, potassium, all kinds of really good stuff. And drink eight to 16 ounces of water, like within the first 10, 15 minutes of waking up. Okay. You may just start with four ounces. You may feel nauseous after that, but work your way up. Over time, you'll kick you'll you'll kickstart that natural hydration mechanism. And what I find for many people, because food is so prevalent in our society, and whenever we eat, we eating itself is an addictive process. We actually stimulate dopamine, which makes us feel really good. And I think that's a great thing. But because food is so prevalent. In our society, compared to what our ancestors had, like we can eat literally all day long. I could sit in my house. I have so much food in here. I could sit in here and just eat for like the next week without stopping, you know, it's like, and just stimulate those dopamine pathways. So we, we lose, there's a part of our, our hypothalamus, which is like the antenna in our brain. And in that area of our, our hypothalamus, the hunger center and the thirst center are right next to each other. And the brain has this, uh, this kind of, it's, it's, the brain is plastic and it will actually um, start to change and shape itself based on the, our actions and our habits. And so we actually start to get some of this hunger center moving into the thirst center. And so we start actually confusing when we're really thirsty and needing minerals with the idea that we're hungry and oftentimes craving sugar or craving some sort of like a sweet comfort food. And so I always want, want my clients, I want people to regain their natural thirst mechanisms. And so between meals, we're always trying to drink. And I, I, I will tell people, you know, make it a goal to drink 16 ounces of water. So if you eat a meal, wait an hour so you can have your, your, your food actually digest properly um, without diluting your stomach acid and digestive juices. But after that, you should be drinking at least 16 ounces of water before your next meal. And ideally, you know, cutting that off at least 15 minutes before you start your next meal. And for some people, it's really hard at first, but over time, they regain their thirst mechanisms. I mean, for me, it's easy for me to drink 48 ounces of water between meals, if not more. I'll oftentimes drink a gallon of water before I even eat anything in the day. And it just makes me feel so good when I'm hydrated and I've got the electrolytes. I feel really good and uh, really on top of the world. And so regaining that that sense of thirst and getting the, the right electrolytes in can make a huge difference. I totally agree with you. I and so I'm from Canada, so we use liters. So I drink four <laughs> liters a day, which yeah. I just had to go to Google and it's 135 ounces. And that took That's me like a years. Gallon. Yeah. Is it okay? You're rocking oh, it, Leanne. Oh yeah. But yeah, you know, you're in the you're I in the guess, gallon club. <laughs> the gallon club. Oh my gosh, I need a sticker for my water bottle. Yeah, exactly. I, I find the easiest way for me to get there because I, I like I like the the action of drinking out of a mug. So I make a lot of like Tulsi tea, herbal teas, and I find they're even really good for my skin. Like when I when I drink more tea and herbal things and I'm just sitting there with my mug and drinking tea. Maybe it's because I'm Canadian. Even when it's like triple digits in Ohio right now, I'm like, where's my tea? And I find I'm so it's so much easier for me to get to my amount by drinking out of a mug. So if anyone's listening and they're like, Ugh, glasses, water bottle, bleh, I agree with you. And I like mugs, so you might want to try that too. I'm, I'm with you on that. Warm drinks are great. Warm drinks, a lot of people find that warm drinks are just more appetizing, you know, especially you're in Canada. Um, you know, here in Georgia, I drink warm drinks most of the time in the morning, actually, because we keep our, our house, even in the summer, like now, we'll keep our AC down at night to sleep better. So when I wake up in the morning, I get up first in the house and like, I've got a pullover on and things like that. It's cold. And I always want, I want something warm. You know, so it just makes sense. And actually warm water will naturally stimulate your migrating motor complex in your gut. So getting good bowel movements, I didn't even touch on that, but I also see a lot of women with constipation issues. And again, that could be a thyroid issue, but warm water in the morning, warm lemon water, warm herbal tea can really do a great number in helping move the bowels. And I think getting a really high quality bowel movement, one or two high quality bowel movements in the first few hours of the day 
will set you up for so much success uh, for the rest of the day. You just feel like this huge load that literally was lifted and um, just all the um, fermentive byproducts that come from feces that's sitting in your, in your gut. Um, that just puts a lot of stress on your body, on your immune system, creates more inflammation, can really cause more brain fog, more mental sluggishness. So getting that really good bowel movement um, and, and hydration as a key, a really huge component to that will, will set you up for success for your day. I totally agree. It's almost like, you know, that old drawing of Mickey Mouse way back in the day and he's just whistling like by the train and he's like, doo, doo, yeah. doo, you know, that he's in, that's what I imagine. Like two good bowel movements yes. before work with some tea and I'm, I'm that Mickey Mouse. Drawing. Life is good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and where can people find you if they want to learn more? Yeah. You can find me at drjockers.com, just D-R-J-O-C-K-E-R-S.com. And of course on my YouTube, Facebook, you know, all the different social channels as well. I love it. We'll make sure to include all of those links in today's podcast extra, which you can get at healthfulpursuit.com slash podcast slash E90. And thanks again for coming on the show, David. I really appreciate it. Leanne, I always love talking with you. Just such a great stimulating conversation and um, just such an honor and a privilege to be on your show. Love what you're doing with it. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks. I'm blushing now. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. Join us again next Sunday to discover more Keto for Women secrets for your fat-fueled life. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, recipes, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be confused as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcasts reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representations or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.